groups and things like that from, from their afternoon sessions. Okay, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Oh, also, it seems like, you know, he did the same thing with Trumbauer, too, you know, because there were those saxophone passages, too, that seemed like a Trumbauer solo. Um, and anything else you want to say about the, the White? So Whiteman didn't rely on stocks at all, because he could... No, but, they, but, but some stocks are based, uh, other than sugar, I mean, like, for instance... Uh, side, it, side by side is, is a revised stock arrangement. So yeah, the one that Nichols... Uh, yeah. And uh, what about uh, you took advantage of me? Is the stock based on the no, equipment or no? It's no, it's a Tom Sutter field. I, I used to play the stock in my band and try to make it like the Whiteman band, but mm -hmm. I finally got the photocopy from Williams College, and mm -hmm. it's a Sutter field, so mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's much different. Right. All right. Well, uh, we jump ahead a little bit uh, uh, now. Some of the Hoagy Carmichael uh, things, like for instance, uh, uh, Rock and Share. The stock is pretty close, isn't it, to the reported version? I think that came later, though. I think you think the stock is based on the record? Yeah, yeah. I think so. I know Barnacle Bill the Sailor is, is a Ken, Ken McConnell stock arrangement uh, that they adapted because it's it's all in 6 8. And they don't go into that swing part. But they, they use that for the That's for what the, they use, for yeah. The, for the you know, that, that particular record seems to have been a big hit on the radio at that time, which I just know because uh, people who are around in that period seem to remember it. Maybe, maybe it was because it was so unusual, too, but I mean, my father, I remember when I played it, I mean, my father is no longer with us, but he was born in 1919, so, you know, he was just, you know, uh, you know 11 years old or something when that came out. But, uh, but when he heard it, he remembered that he heard it on the radio at the time. And also, I was just, I, I just working with Marty Napoleon. Mm -hmm. And he, and, and he just, uh, apropos, I don't know what, just alluded to having heard that. Really? On the radio, yeah. That's, that's got to be the hardest thing to make into a jazz vehicle. I mean, that, that, you know, <laughs> if, if, if it, to say anything about these guys taking a tune like Barnaby Bowl the Sailor and making a, a, a wonderful jazz recording, there's some genius there for sure. <laughs> Everybody plays so well on that. Maybe they're just so pent up through the rest of it. Uh, yeah. And and interesting, isn't that the same session that they did? Uh, uh, um, uh, you know, um, uh, blanking out the the one I was just talking about. Uh, uh, Rock, rock and chair. It's the same session, which means that Bob Romano is playing second trumpet to fix, yeah. playing lead through all that 6 8 stuff, which yeah. is pretty wild. Yeah. It'd be nice to have a video of that, you know, as a, a Vitaphone watching them do that. Don't get me started about yeah. my fantasies of going back and putting little cameras, you know, in recording studios and jazz clubs. Right. Uh, what, about, what about the three big spider back in his orchestra sides? Is it, do you have any? Any idea? Are the stocks close? Well, you know, say the you know the two go deep down south, and I'll be a friend with pleasure. Are the stocks at all anything like those? No, no. not at all. Okay. We, we played through them, and you get you know when, when you hand out the arrangement, it was, oh boy, you know, Bix recorded this, and then you hear what. I mean, the stocks are very nice, but it's very disappointing. It's like, oh, it's not the same. Yeah. It's not the same. The. Uh, you know, the I'll be a friend uh, with pleasure arrangement that Bix records is very interesting and, and unusual in a lot of ways. Mm. And I uh, I always thought that Bix had something to, I don't know who was credited with it, who who actually did it, but uh, I really think that he had something to do with putting that together. You know, there's this talk that maybe uh, Brodsky, uh, the uh -huh. piano player, had, right. had something to do with it. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, a lot of times, uh, the, these little wonderful pieces of history are just are just lost. You know, the, the everyone's gone, and yeah. you, 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 even asking some of these fellows like Bill Chalice and and Bill Rank after all these years, they, they just don't remember. You know, it's sort of trying to remember something from 40 years ago in our lives. Yeah. And they were so busy, and they were working so much. It was just another day. It was just another day. They had no concept that they were making history, talking with guys like Joe Tardo and Arnold Brill Hart, and, and we were just busy, we are happy, we are working. They didn't think they were creating history, but they were chosen. Irving Brodsky was yes. one of the last to uh, die, though, because he was alive and he was, you know, lived to be in his 90s, right? Yeah. yeah. Phil Schaap used to interview him, but I don't know if he, if he ever mentioned uh, doing that arrangement. 
I remember. I think I think listening to the radio broadcast. Yeah. I've kind of reached the conclusion though that Big's you know, Big's definitely had a hand in, in, in some of the uh, a lot of the Wolverines arrangements. He was a guiding force. And of course the Trump hours and the Big Sims gang. And of course you hear his influence on the uh, you know in the in, in, you know Chalice is writing and all you know, of Bix, uh, doing introductions and so forth. Yeah. Did someone else notate that for him? Uh, I, well, if I understood Bill Rank correctly, no, he actually wrote them down. But they were short excerpts. I think, you know, it's much easier to do that than to, you know, notate a piano piece with lines going on at the same time, which is what Chalice helped him do. Why did he read in Whiteman's orchestra? He, he did read. Uh, I think that whole I think he wasn't a good reader in the beginning, but he became a better reader. And, uh, and uh, practice makes better, I think. And, and Bill told him many times that he could read this stuff, and he became a better reader. Sort of, you know, rusty in the beginning, and uh, but when, when he got to the white man, he knew he, he had to step up to the plate and, and really get with the, the program there, and, and did, did a wonderful job. Uh, and talking about writing things, I just want to mention this because when <coughs> Bill had Bix write out his piano music, <coughs> how this came about was <coughs> Jack Robbins, who had Robbins music, uh, also published Paul Whiteman publications. Sometimes you see some of these things, you see a little caricature, you know, the Paul Whiteman and the potato head, and it's say, you know, Robbins music, uh, Paul Whiteman, uh, or, or Paul Whiteman presents uh, something like, you know. Um, Jack Robbins wanted, for his catalog, another Rhapsody in Blue. <coughs> Rhapsody in Blue was such a big piece in the 1920s, and still is, it's a great piece, and made a lot of uh, history for George Gershwin and, and for the publisher that that, that represented, which was Harms. So Jack Robbins knew Bill, was involved with, with modern music, and he says, Trying to get the spider back to write something here. They heard, you know, they heard uh, in the mist, and uh, Bill wrote that out. And consequently, Bill got uh, Bix over to the apartment and wrote out these things. And he said uh, B Bix was constantly changing things all the time. And he said he'd write something on the music paper, and they'd have to erase it and erase it and erase it because Bix would come up with new ideas. He says finally. Since there were no more music staves on the paper, they erased <laughs> everything. So we we got to start with a brand new piece of piece of music manuscript. And Bix was always changing things. He always was thinking of something new and fresh. And this is it was really hard. And then Bill finally said, "Okay, Bix, this is it. This is it. You know, you can't do anything better than this. We got to send it to the publisher." And finally did. And and Bix would come back with another revision. And you know. But it was, it was fascinating uh, to hear how those wonderful piano pieces were done. And, and in fact, the, uh, you know, of course, in a mist, the recorded version is very different from the published version. And uh, <coughs> interestingly enough, I uh, had somebody locate the, uh, you know, the lead sheet filed with the Library of Congress to copyright it. And that is just a transcription of the recorded version. And uh, because that was that was done out earlier, that was in uh, 1927, and uh, uh, and it's in a very beautiful hand. I don't know who wrote it, but, uh, but it doesn't doesn't appear to be fixed. So. Uh, I mean, we we have maybe a couple of minutes. Peter Eklund is going to do a presentation, uh, which is going to be very interesting uh, and uh, deal with some aspects of fix that. Uh, have to be heard, you can't read about, so that's going to be fascinating. Uh, five o'clock, I'll be giving a talk about Bix and, uh, as a pioneer of race relations, so you'll have to come to that to see what, what the hell that's all about. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 but we have time for a few more questions. Yeah, Albert. Uh, and one thing that surprises me a lot, Bill Chalice was a pioneer of race relations.